What is truth? What is truth? Come. What is truth? Don't make me beg you, please. <laughs> please. Truth is fact. Okay. Anything else? What is truth? It's, it's a perception of some people. Your perception of some people. Oh, so, so your perception, my perception, someone else's per perception. So it sounds very individual. At the back, that's, I've just got the comment saying that's not truth, yeah? So, sorry, ab it's absolute, good, yeah? It's real, yeah? According to who? <laughs> According to who? What is truth? Surely truth is just a perception. Surely truth is just yours. Surely truth is subjective according to you, how you understand reality, how you've seen the past, the present, and will see the future. But then you're absolutely right, so you said, but how we understand truth is truth is an absolute, which means there is only one. So then whose truth in this room of 120 people is the one? Whose truth is more important than the other person's truth that's in this room here today? Everyone. Everyone's truth is important. Anyone else? In an ideal world, we'll say everyone's truth is equally important. No one's truth is more important than another person's truth. What is the reality? My truth is the most important, right? And your truth is the most important. That's what we do. We say, this is my truth. This is mine. And the way we understand truth, it is right. It is just. It is absolute. So anyone who doesn't really have my same truth must be what? Yeah. Less true. Less true. The further we get away, most untrue, most untrue, completely false. And what are we really doing when I'm walking down the scale? We're just making value judgments and devaluing. Nah, yeah, that's close to mine, so I can agree with you. Yeah, coming a little bit further from mine. Wonderful, wonderful. And that's what we do. Because we think that our truth is the most important, that our headache must be the worst headache, that how we see the world must be correct. Then when we come out of a meeting and someone says, you know, I feel like that was a really sexist remark the client made. Well, what do you mean? Don't be so sensitive. Women are so sensitive. All we're really doing is we're taking a situation, running it through our lens, and we're saying, your headache is illegitimate. So what do we do? We need to start letting go, not of our truths, but of our obsession that our truth is the one. Because our truth is not the one. Also, we need to start removing this idea of truth. All truth is are thoughts, beliefs, and opinions that you have, which means that they can change. And hopefully they do change, because that that's what we need. We need changing perspectives. That's what diversity is. So, let go of your truth that's irrelevant, right? But it's important to you. So if you're going to respect and love your truth, Respect and other pe love other people's truth. That's really the call to action. You are not the most important thing. And then when somebody comes in with a different opinion and a different thought or a different experience of something, how do we re-centralize that person and say, you have to be correct because this is your truth? And you know what happens then? All of a sudden, women aren't sensitive or oversensitive. Then we're saying, sure, there's something going on here. What do you think this hashtag Me Too is about? Right? Everyone sees on, on Facebook now, on social media now, women who have been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted are using the hashtag me too. And you will see people come with and say, oh, that's not my truth, that's not my understanding. If we could just stop and say, this is this person's truth, then all of a sudden, we spend two hours talking about the issues as opposed to an hour and 45 minutes saying why women are so sensitive. It's the same thing with men are trash as an example, right? If we have a two hour conversation, we're using an hour and 50 minutes to say why men aren't trash and not all men. Why don't we just spend the full two hours saying, well, if this is your truth, let's talk about it. That's what we need to start doing. And especially from a race perspective in South Africa. Black people are oversensitive. You're always putting the race card. Maybe there's something there. Wouldn't you agree? That is being pulled all the time because we actually have an issue. Start owning it. This was my, um, this was my niece, Phoebe. She's 13 years old in this photo. And she grew up in New Zealand, and they came to South Africa in November. That was the first time I'd met her. And she turned to me and said, Roy, I am a romantic, or a pansexual romantic homosexual. And I said, that is wonderful. 
and then we had to go like research furiously <laughs> what she just said, right? <laughs> pansexual, I'm attracted to everything and anything, doesn't matter, but I want to fall in love with another woman. I'm a pansexual, romantic, homosexual, 13 years old. And I was like, that's amazing. This is Leo. Phoebe, Leo. I lost a niece two weeks ago and I've gained a nephew. So Leo is actually, <laughs> Leo is transgender. She came, he came out two weeks ago as transgender. And it's been a really interesting process for, for, for me in particular, for somebody who lives this work and does this work, sitting and saying, I've got so much fear that's come up as a result of this. Like, it's cool to talk about in practice. And now I've just been confronted by this and there's so much fear that's just come up and I've got to literally sit and work through that fear, right? And how do I create a space where, she, where he feels comfortable? See, even I have to like learn constantly. Where he feels completely loved and supported. Because it's not my truth. This is this person's truth. This is this person's lived experience. How can I support that? That's my only role. But as an example of how, for me, the biggest example with Phoebe Leo is that there's a global rise in consciousness which is happening in our world. 13 years old. Transgender is not a new thing. It's been around since hieroglyphics. But all of a sudden, we're seeing it more and more. Why? Because there's a growing sense of consciousness in our world. Because of social media, we are now attached. We have access to information. We feel safer. But what do you think is the counterbalancing force to the rising sense of consciousness in our world? The rising sense of what? Fear and anger. And we see that more, most acutely with Trump and the rise of populism, right? Like, how do we balance out the growing rise in consciousness of connectedness? We have to create fear and division. Right? That's just what happens. That's exactly how we see it. And we really have to ask ourselves, are we on the side of consciousness or fear? And understanding that we'll move between them all the time. But as long as we're kind of always in this blue block and always kind of fighting for the ideas of consciousness and open conversations, or you to use the words crucial conversations, that's critical that we can constantly be learning. Movements like Roads Must Fall, movements like Thieves Must Fall, Pretoria Hair, these are all movements of consciousness. And you can see with these movements, most clearly, how fear reacts to that rise in consciousness. It says, no, no, not going to happen. This is something that is bad. We don't want this. You don't want to talk about this. But it's happening, and we need to kind of start learning the tools as to how we deal with this.